We're starting a whole new series today on, or we're going to call it the Tent of Meeting. It's about the tabernacle in the wilderness. Our ser- this year, our theme is to look at our Jewish roots and how Christianity flows out of that, how Jesus, who himself was a Jew, became the Messiah, well, came to be the Messiah that God had promised. Now, i got a quick question for you. What would you think if you had a friend... That friend was a farmer, big farm, let's make him a chicken farmer, for instance. Big, big barns with lots of chickens in the coop. And Yeah, that's not pleasant already. My brother Randy, when we were uh, both you know, young and home and still working, he worked at a chicken farm. And I would drop him off in the morning and then go to my job, and then I'd go back and reluctantly pick him up at the end of the day. There is nothing, nothing worse than the smell of chicken dung. It's, I would have him sit in the back seat with the windows rolled down. But imagine your friend said, you know what? I'm thinking that I am going to move out of the farmhouse and move into the chicken coop. You'd think, you're crazy, wouldn't you? Why on earth would you do that? Well, I, I want to get to know the chickens better. I want to relate to the chickens better. I want to be there, right there with them. You've lost your mind. But really, in reality, that is exactly what God does with us. And frankly, our sin, sin has a stench far worse than chicken manure to a holy and perfect God, and yet he says, I want to move into the neighborhood. I want to be right there in and with them, and he God does that. And the tabernacle that we're going to look at over the next, well, number of weeks is God saying, I want to be right there in the middle of them. And ultimately, of course, he does that when Jesus comes. The tabernacle's all about that. Today we're going to look at the why. If you want to take the uh, tan-colored page out of your bulletin and walk along with it, there's lots of stuff we're going to walk through here this morning as we introduce this series. Today, the why of the tabernacle. And over the next few weeks here this fall, we'll talk about the what and how each of these pieces is a prophecy of God. Each is a picture of Jesus who would come. It's amazing stuff. Now, whenever we do a series here at Parkwood Gardens, if you're with us, we have a purpose for it. And there are things that we're going to learn in each series we do. So over the next few weeks here this fall, we're going to learn that God wants to dwell with his people. Now, this is a good jump off from last week when we looked at the Feast of Tabernacles that our Jewish friends are celebrating right now. Even this week, some of your Jewish friends are sleeping out in their sukkah or having their meals out in their sukkah in their backyard or on their porch or their balcony if they're in an apartment, remembering that God dwelled with them during the wilderness wanderness, wilderness wandering period. I dare you to try to say that. Because God wants to dwell with his people. And we see that over and over. Here he had said, I want them to make a sanctuary for me and I'll dwell among them. Later we see Jesus himself, the word of God, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That word literally is, is tabernacled with us. He, he pitched his tent with us, some translations say in English. It's great. God wants to be with us. And of course, ultimately, for eternity... John writes in the book of Revelation, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God was with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be where? With them and be their God. It's what God has always wanted. It's why he made us and this is all part of it. We're going to be learning that over this, uh, the weeks of this fall. Secondly, we're going to learn that God is specific about how we are to worship him. Not just specific, but, but even a little bit fussy, even a little bit particular in how he wants us to worship him. Now, don't get crazy on that. We'll talk about it as we go along. When we look at this tabernacle, this tent temple, if you will, each piece is to be of a specific material or a specific color. And there's symbolism we're going to see in each piece and what materials used and the colors. When they moved it around in the wilderness, they covered each piece and, and the coverings were separate colors and they all had meeting. We'll talk about some of that next week. 
God's particular. He said, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings. How? Exactly like the pattern I will show you. Wow, we'll come back to that. A third thing we're going to learn over this series is that God is holy, and he expects us to be holy as well. He says, hang the curtain, the veil, from the clasps and place the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, behind the curtain, and the curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. The Kadesh, the holy place, from the Kadesh he Kadeshim, how'd they do? Not bad. <laughs> Which is the holiest of the holies. And God is saying, I am here, I am holy, I am pure. Now, when we use that very word holy, we, we've turned it into a religious word today, haven't we? I mean, do you ever use the word other than holy smokes? Other than that, do you ever use the word holy other than a, you know, kind of religious context? But it didn't start that way. Initially, the word holy meant separate or different. And of course, ultimately, who is, with personhood, who is the most different, the most separate? It's God. He is he is so different, so separate. He's pure, which is what holy has become to mean as well. And this place where God is is to be separate and even separated by that veil so that the purity of God and our sinfulness don't mix because we're the ones that would pay. And we too are called to be separate from people, different, more pure and holy as we walk with God too. So we're excited about all that stuff. And as we start this series, one of the first things, where do we get the name? This, this, this tent building that God told them to build that we're going to talk about, where do we get the name for it? What will we call it? Well, there are a whole bunch of places in the Bible where it's given two names together here in Exodus. So all the work on the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. All right, interesting. Then set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the month. And again, place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And 33 other verses all put these two together. The tabernacle, the tent of meeting. So we're going to call it that. Now, it's also got other names, too. Sometimes it's called the, the tent of testimony, you know, where God gives testimony that he's real, he's alive, he's there. Or the... the uh, dwelling place of God or the sanctuary of God, but we're going to call this series the tent of meeting because that's the whole point where God wants to meet us and be with us. Let me give you a little quick history that leads up to this tabernacle. Where does it start? Well, it starts with creation. God wants to be with us. He made us for relationship. And indeed, there in the Garden of Eden, we're told that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. They had coffee and donuts at night. It was great. God enjoyed his time with them until there was sin, and, and they recognized already that things were broken, and they hid, and, and God eventually had to kick them out because, boy, their sin and his perfection don't mix. Thousands of years later, God says, I'm ready to reveal myself through a specific people so that I can show who I am and what I want. And, and he's God, so he doesn't do things the easy way, the simple way. He picks an old couple who've had no children and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And Abraham and Sarah look at each other and say, who, us? Really? And then he waits 25 more years till they're 90 and 100 years old. And they have a child. God makes this covenant with them. I'll bless the world through you. And, and so they have this child, Isaac. And then Isaac has twin boys. And, and Jacob, Yaakov, means deceiver. But eventually he wrestles with God and God changes his name and calls them Yisrael, strength with God. And so the 12 sons, more or less, of Jacob become the 12 tribes of Israel. And son number 11, the first from the wife that he loved, Rachel, his name is Joseph. And his brothers, oh my goodness, they hate him because he's the favorite. And you all know the story of how he gets the special coat no one else has, maybe multicolored. It was yellow and puce and green and orange, and, right? 
Oh, they hate him. And they tell dad that he died when they sell him as a slave in Egypt. But it's all part of God's plan to get his people safe in the breadbasket of the land of Goshen in Egypt where they can grow. Now, when you turn the page from the end of Genesis to the start of the book of Exodus, you've turned 400 years. They, when last saw, we saw our special people, they were there, there were 70 of them that moved from Canaan to Egypt, and now, my goodness, there may be more than 2 million of them. They've grown over these 400 years. They're so numerous that the Egyptians say, they could overpower us, we need to make them slaves. And they do just that. And God sends Moses. He raises up Moses, and oh boy, we could talk so much about each of these characters, and it's so amazing. But Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, well, God says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, God sends the plagues. Eventually, they're off, crossing through the Red Sea, and they end up down at Mount Sinai, where God says, stop, wait. I want to talk to you, and Moses climbs up Mount Sinai, not once, not twice. Have you ever been mountain climbing? Five times Moses climbs this mountain, and he gets three things from God. Now, if you've got your pen handy, I forget where the blanks are, but if you've got your pen or pencil handy, there are three things that God gives Moses up on Mount Sinai. Three things. First, and the one everybody knows about, he gives him the Ten Commandments. And yes, God, Moses looks like Charlton Heston. It's true. Everybody knows that. He gives him the Ten Commandments. Now, that's not all God's law. It's an outline of God's law. How we deal with God and his authority and how we deal with each other, that's all part of the Ten Commandments. And somebody told me this morning they read through the book of Deuteronomy in the process where Moses expounds on the Ten Commandments there. God also gave him the covenant and renewed it with him, renewed the covenant. God had made this covenant, I will be your God, you'll be my people, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Well, it's been 400 years, and it's time to renew that. You're my people, and I will watch over you. I'll be your God. And then God gives him plans up on Mount Sinai for this tent of meeting, this tabernacle that they would, where they would meet together. Now, this is pretty cool, I think, actually. Why are these three things important? I, I think for a whole bunch of reasons. But one, if we're going to have a relationship with God, first, we have to realize that God is pure and we are sinners so that we do something about it. Amen? And the Ten Commandments show us how much we need God. And then the covenant shows us that we are loved by God. I'll be your God. I'll watch over you. And then the plans for the tabernacle. The tabernacle says God has a way to take care of our sin. There is a plan. And while the tabernacle, we'll talk about in a moment, the stuff that happened there covered sin, all of it, and this is the main reason why we're studying this, all of it points ahead to Jesus, the Messiah, who would come and take away our sin. Now there, God made the plans for the tabernacle, they came from God, but the materials came from the people. It's amazing. God himself is the architect. Hey, a quick question for you. Have you ever built anything? You planned something out? Maybe it was a kitchen renovation or you're building something, and then kind of halfway through, or maybe when you were done, you looked back and said, oh, I wish we'd have done this too. That ever happened to you? Everybody's nodding. Well, this is God. He thinks ahead. He knows ahead. And so his plan was perfect. The people had a part to play, though, as well. And it's great. Now, here's what God said. Here's what God said to the people. The Lord said to Moses, they're up on Mount Sinai, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold and silver and silver and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant offerings, 
and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate of the high priest. We'll see all of these things in coming weeks. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. And I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern that I will show you. Amazing stuff. We'll come back to some of that here in a minute. This is great. But why, why did God have them build this tabernacle? Today is the why about it. Ready? A couple of things. Let me give you four reasons. First, it gave the people a sense of God's presence. For them to have this tabernacle right in the middle of them, 12 tribes, three tribes on each of the four sides, and there's God right in the middle. There was a sense of God's presence. You who are parents, do you remember when your kids were little and they would come running into your bed, into your room, and they'd be crying and they'd want to sleep with mommy and daddy? No? Remember that? Just a sense of, I'm there, I'm protected. Well, here were these Israelites, and they have been in slavery. Now they're in the middle of the desert, in the wilderness. And just to know God is there with them, how comforting would that be? Right there in the middle of them. Secondly, it gave the people a place for atonement of sin. A place when they recognized their sin, and the Ten Commandments would have pointed that out, where it could be taken care of. Now, Two weeks ago, we celebrated Yom Kippur, Yom the day, Kippur of atonement. And the word Kippur for atonement comes from kaper, which means to cover. And we saw then, two weeks ago, that the blood of the bulls and goats and whatever the sacrifices could only cover the sin. So it's not just out there in the open, and, and it would be covered at that time. And God wanted it covered, and so they knew God had a plan. He had an ultimate plan, but that was his plan at that time. There's a third reason God get, had them build this tabernacle. It was a place where God could meet with mankind. A place where they could get together, where they could talk, where God would meet with them. For the generations to come, God says, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. A place where they would meet and God could come and share with them. Amazing stuff. And one more reason God had them build this tabernacle, it was a picture of each step of salvation. And we'll see this week after week after week. Every single piece of furniture in this place, everything right to the tent pegs had meaning in it. Every color that God chose, and he chose the colors, everything pointed to how we would be saved when the Messiah would come. And we're going to learn this in the upcoming weeks together. Now, why, why should we study this tabernacle? Why would we take a number of weeks to look at this building and the pieces that are in it? Years ago, I went to Israel. I had a, just a blast. It was amazing. And to, uh, to be able to picture places and, and events and things that happened was, was great. And even now, as I'm able to teach, you know, and to picture and describe some of these things, it was amazing. And of course, one of the days we went to Bethlehem and we went to the Church of the Nativity, the place where they say Jesus was born. And you walk into this big, old, I mean, seriously old church. And you walk around the back and underneath the altar, and, and they say this was the cave, this was the area. And, and here at this part, spot, they say, is where Jesus was born, where Mary gave birth to him. And, and across from that, here's the place where the manger was and where she laid him. And, and we don't know if any of that is actually true. But it's amazing and humbling and wonderful to be there. But it didn't change my life. It was cool, but it didn't change my life. I honestly think to fully understand what we're going to learn over these next eight weeks, to fully understand the meaning of this tabernacle and what God is doing there and, and the symbolism that's there is life-changing. I really believe that. It changes our understanding of Scripture. It can change our understanding of who God is. It can affect our understanding of who we are and God, what God wants of us. So, with that foundation, I think the reason we're going to study this uh, tabernacle is, well, fivefold. One, 
it's a major portion of Scripture. Did you know that over 50, count them, 50 chapters of Scripture are devoted to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting? Let me give you a little context. Matthew has 28 chapters. Did you see where it went? Hope it's not broken. Thank you, Jordan. Matthew, oh, good, still working, unlike the ones at home. Matthew has 28 chapters, okay? And Mark has 16 chapters, and Luke, 24 chapters, and John, 22 chapters. There are more than double that number of chapters just on the tabernacle. Each of these books talk about Jesus' whole life, right? If you put all of Paul's letters together, there's about 80 chapters. Well, there are 50 chapters on the tabernacle. That's a big chunk of Scripture. Would you agree? And if God's devoting that much of the Bible to it, we should pay a little bit of attention to it, I think, too. So that's one reason. Another reason I think we will is that these furnishings teach us the plan of salvation. And we're going to spend time looking at each one, but let me just give you a, a quick walkthrough here this morning so you see what I mean. First, it's a tent fence that goes all the way around that makes a courtyard. And in that outer courtyard, when you first come in, maybe there is some sacrifice that you need to make for some reason. Some of them were negative reasons because, yikes, you have sinned and you knew this was the offering. Others were positive reasons. You had a baby, you had a son, and you want to go back and give a, a Thanksgiving offering, redeem that child. There are lots of reasons. But you come in through the one gate. There's only one way to God. Bible's clear. This points it out. One gate, you walk in, and the first thing you see is the bronze altar. Big altar with a grate on the bottom, and the fire is going. And you would take your lamb, if it were, and you would give it to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice that lamb. He would put some of its blood on the horns of the altar, and the horns are the power of God. And the, the body itself, the carcass itself, would be burned up. It's a sacrifice, burned up to God there on the altar. It's the first thing. And of course, as we know, Jesus comes to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, behind that bronze altar is a basin or a, a laver. Those of you who speak French, it would be a lave. Okay, that's the end of my French. And that, of course, it's a place where you wash up. Now, now, there's not really a description of what it looks like. Some people have a picture kind of like of a bird bath. Others have kind of a pot with spigots that come out of it. But the bottom line is it's a place where you wash up. Because that priest, and that's where the priest would go. He would be physically dirty for sure, but he would be spiritually unclean as well. And, and he would go and wash up. And, and Jesus says... Wow, he wants to cleanse us. If we confess our sin, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a picture of baptism in there as well. Now, then you came to a little room. Well, it's a little building, if you can say a tent is a building. And it was, we'll talk about it in a moment, a little more detail. But again, one door to go in. And the priest would go in, and as he would go in, there were several pieces of furniture in there too. And each points to Jesus. On the left, there would be a candlestick, a candelabra, if you will, a menorah. It's called the lampstand. And it was one solid piece of gold that would have been hammered into something as beautiful and intricate as this. Boy, those guys were goldsmiths. You know anybody named Goldsmith? It's where the name comes from. And they would have hammered that into place. And it would be filled with oil. And it would be lit every day, refilled and lit every day. And it would light this holy place that was inside. And of course, when Jesus comes there, when they brought menorahs out on the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus says to them, I am the light of the world. The light of the world. Now, on the right side, that's on the left. On the right side is the table of showbread, the old King James Bible says. Our New International Version, many of you have, says the table of the presence bread. It's the presence of God there with us, that God is there. And the priest on this table, every Friday, would put 12 loaves of bread there on that table for God. Now, when I was a kid growing up, I pictured, you know, loaves of Wonder Bread, you know. 
But this is more of the bread that they would make. Now, here's the tough part. The priest's job was to take last week's 12 loaves and eat them. Yeah, that's my thought too. Weak old bread sitting out in the desert. Hmm, dry, moldy. But did you know that the Bible says, the Bible says that that bread was still as soft and warm and fresh as when it came out the oven for him to eat. Wow, that's kind of crazy. All right, good. And the idea again is that 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of God's chosen people. And, and Jesus himself comes and says he's the bread of life. And, and we are his chosen people as well today. It's amazing. Now, there in the middle, just in front of the veil that we read about earlier, the curtain that separated this holy place, the Kadesh, from the holy of holies, there was an incense altar. Now, it looked like the big bronze altar that was out in the courtyard, but it was smaller. And it would have had coals on it too, but its purpose was to have incense that lifted up to God. And the priest would come in and, and he would put incense on there and, and it would burn and it would rise up to God. Now, Lynette likes to go to Yankee Candle. You like candles? And she buys different kinds of candles, and they each have a different, unique smell. I think the stores only sell pumpkin spice right now, but <laughs> all of the smells. And you can pick which one you like. Well, the incense would be rising to God and representing the prayers of people, but there was one special incense that went on there that you just didn't use anywhere else. This was not a Yankee candle smell. This was called, maybe you've heard of it before, frankincense frankincense and the priest would burn that on there and jesus himself the bible says jesus himself is the one who speaks to god on our behalf first john chapter 2 if you want to jot that down he's the advocate that when we sin he speaks to the father on our behalf raising up that prayer if you will to god now behind that was the curtain the veil and that veil separated sinful man from the pure and holy God. And there's more furniture in there. The box was in there called the Ark of the Covenant. If you've seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you've seen the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark actually is just the bottom. It's a box. It's made of wood but covered with gold. And there were different things that were kept inside of it. We'll talk about in future weeks. But the top, the cover, was called the atonement cover or the mercy seat. And it was one piece of gold solid gold and on the top made out of this gold were two angels cherubs or plural cherubim that were there and when God himself after it was all set up when God himself would come a pillar of cloud would come above it and the Shekinah glory of God would be there seated between the cherubs the presence of God there in this holy of holy place amazing time and each each of these pieces, every one of them, reminds them of the plan of salvation and, re, and how we are to relate to God. Some would say that even how all this furniture is laid out, you see my fingers, makes a cross as well, pointing ahead to the ultimate atonement or payment for our sin in Jesus. So, why should we study this? Well, each piece, every piece, teaches us the plan of salvation. And then thirdly, we should study this because the materials and the colors teach us how particular God is in how we worship him and how we come before him. Okay, again, he can be a little fussy about some things in how we worship him. He says to the people, I want you to use the colors and the metals and the materials that I say and don't change them. Don't change them. And he's God, and he has the right to determine. Now, if you were to build a house, you get a builder to build a house for you, you could tell them what carpet and what paint color and what drapes and where to put the kitchen. You could do all that stuff because it's your house, right? Right? And you would make these decisions based on what you like. I would like the kitchen here. I like this color. I would like that, right? Isn't that how we would do it? Sure, of course. Well, God doesn't pick 
these various materials and colors. We'll talk about all this stuff next week and future weeks. God doesn't pick all these things just because he likes them on a whim. Every single thing is symbolic. Every single thing has meaning to it. And all of it points ahead to Jesus, the Messiah who would come. It's amazing. So we should study it. And we should study it because it shows us that God never changes. His plan of salvation is always the same, always has been. We'll talk about that in a moment. And number five, we should study it, I think, because it enhances our understanding of the New Testament. And it's a preview of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ when he comes, as he comes to be the Lamb who pays for our sins, the light of the world, the bread of life, all that we need as he comes for us. Now let me, let me talk briefly about the little building there in the middle of the courtyard. And when I say little, let me tell you five things about it. They all start with P. You ready? Number one. P, it was petite. Thank you. If they're going to be P's, you know, it's petite. It's just small. This place is not huge. Okay, here, for you old timers, it's 15 feet wide by 15 feet tall by 45 feet long. For you young'uns, five meters wide by 15 meters long. So I got out the tape measure here. We have a tape measure. And I measured it out. So it would be from the edge of the platform to the middle. That's 15 feet. That's five meters. That's how big it was and how tall it was. Does that look like a big building to you? I mean, it fits on our platform, half our platform. Wow. So it's just a small place when you see it. It's not only petite, it's portable. It's portable. Imagine a place for worship that's portable. And we're going to see, and you've probably seen this before, that each one of these pieces of furniture has little rings in the side because they put poles through the rings and they carried them around. When that cloud lifted from over this tabernacle, they packed everything up and moved. And, and when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And when the cloud went back over the tabernacle, God's presence was in there once again. It was portable. They moved it. Now, guess how long they used it? Most people think, well, 40 years, right? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. No. Once they got into the promised land under Joshua, you know, fought the battle of Jericho and all, they set it up in Shiloh, and there it stayed for a total of about 500 years. Through all the years of the judges, right up to when Solomon built the temple and the ark was moved into the temple. For 500 years, they used this thing. 40 years, it was portable. It's not only that, but it's pricey. It was pricey. So now, what do you mean, pricey? Well, <clears throat> you've already heard me talk about gold, gold, and more gold, right? I thought, given that we are building a new place, which will eventually be our worship center, that I would have a little bit of a comparison. <laughs> the tabernacle versus... Our new building. Well, the tabernacle will be 675 square feet. Ours will be 8,000 square feet. All right? Now, the price of the tabernacle, scholars tell us, you know, with the gold and the price of gold today, if it was built today, it would cost about $50 million. We're now just for our building, not the elevator, not the extra parking, not the new lighting outside and stuff. Just our building is about $1.6 million just for the new building. So when you figure out the per square foot, yes, our building is costing us $200 per square foot. The tabernacle cost, you ready? $74,074 per square foot. It's a little pricey. Don't you think? A little pricey. And not just, but remember the purpose. You see, the purpose was, this was the house for God. This was God. The, the priest would go in there. He would put oil and light the lights. He would put bread there on the table. He would put incense, but then he would leave. Who lived in this place? God. This is the place for God. And God says, hey, make it what it should be for me. It was pure. It was completely dedicated and consecrated to God. Everything was dedicated or consecrated with blood as they set it up initially too. And then also it was perfect. 
It was designed in such a perfect way that even today, we'll see over the future weeks, it makes perfect sense to us when we see it and what it all means and the symbolism in it. 300, 3,500 years later, it still makes perfect sense. I'm excited for us to look at it and talk about it and, and look at each piece and what God is doing in it and pointing ahead for us in it. Now, how do we apply this this morning? A couple of things. Number one, I think we need to understand that worship is extremely important to God. Worship is extremely important to God. Now, many of us, we come to church on Sundays out of habit. And we don't really give a lot of thought to it. And it's Sunday, we set the alarm clock, we get up, we get in the car, we come, and we don't put a lot of thought to it. Now, that's a good habit to have. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, God says, don't get out of the habit of gathering together. Oh, but here's something else God says. You do it all the more as the day approaches so that you can encourage each other. You come. I had somebody a while back say to me, they're just not happy. Because when they come to church, they want to come in, they want to sit quietly and prepare their hearts, and it's just too noisy in here. I said, well, you know, the purpose of being in here, right, is not to be quiet. The purpose is to gather to encourage each other. So if worship is so important to God, and it is, we should, before we leave home, take some time and say, God, help me to encourage somebody when I get to church. Amen? God, help me be vocal in my praise and in my encouragement to somebody else today. I mean, even if you forgot at home before you leave, take a moment in your car and prepare your heart. But once you get in here, look for somebody to encourage. Because that's why God says we gather. Yes, to praise and sing and learn and grow. But to encourage each other is why we can do some of those things alone. Gather together. Take some time. Worship is important to God. And we need to take that time as, uh, every week and be a part of it. Plan. Prepare. Be ready. Come expecting to meet God and to learn and to be encouraged as you encourage somebody else. Number two. Another thing I think out of all this that should affect us is that we should understand that there has only ever been one way of salvation. Only ever one way of salvation. One of the questions that maybe I get asked as frequently as anything else is, how did Noah or Abraham or David get to heaven? I mean, Jesus hadn't come and died on the cross for their sins yet. How did they get to heaven? And the answer is the same way that we do, with trust in God's provision for their sin. Now, they were looking ahead to the Messiah who would pay for their sin, and we look back to the Messiah, Jesus, who paid for our sin, but it's the same. The Bible says throughout that it was their faith in him that saved them. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. If you will, and don't push this analogy too far, it's like they had their faith in God, and he put it in the bank, and when Jesus died, it was like, there you go, it's been on deposit, heaven you get. Okay, don't push that too far, but yeah, the same, God is the same, and his plan of salvation has always been faith in him and his provision for our sin. And then one last thing, maybe the most practical thing today, talk with your family with your children, with your friends, about this, this building, this tabernacle, this tent of meeting, and learn all that you can about it. Now, in the bottom of your notes, and I hope everybody got a copy of the notes, I've got uh, two or three different uh, websites there that you can look to and that you can check out, places that teach us more about, more about the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, you can get a tabernacle kit like, you could order it and have it shipped. You could have it this week, and they go from pretty inexpensive little paper or cardboard ones where you could set them up with your kids, maybe, and talk about what's going on and what these pieces are week by week. I mean, there are more expensive ones that are plastic, and I was thinking of getting a bigger one and putting it on the table in the lobby and adding the pieces each week, but then I remembered what happens to our nativity scene every year where the wise men end up all over the place. And 
We'll still see about that. But you could pick one up for home and talk about it and see about it. And it's great. And I have something else. <clears throat> In the lobby on the table, I have picked up a hundred, it's not nearly enough, I know, a hundred of these uh, full-color brochures that talk about every piece, and they are there, and I would, l so there's only enough if like one per family or one per couple, or if you're single, feel free to take one. Now, if you want to make a donation of like five, they're $4.99 US. If you want to make a donation of five bucks toward it, great. If, if you can't afford that, I'd love to have you just take one anyway. Uh, again, you're here in the first service. You paid the price to get up early. If there's <laughs> not enough for all everybody in the second service, we'll see about getting more. But uh, I'd love for you as a family or as a couple to take one and read up and study. Plus, we've got life groups that we'll be studying each week <clears throat> and talking. There's extra stuff they'll watch and chat about what we learn each week as well. All right? Let's close with where we started. It would be absolutely, absolutely absurd for a chicken farmer to move out of the farmhouse and into the chicken coop. But it's even more absurd for a pure, almighty God to want to move in and dwell with us with the stench of our sin as well, but he does. And he demonstrated it there with that tabernacle, and he lived it out when Jesus came and lived with us. And don't we look forward to being with the, in the joy and perfection of God for eternity too? Let's pray. Father, I'm so excited, so grateful for what you've done for us, how you put together, Lord, in this tabernacle, a plan, a picture that wasn't just about what would happen then, but what Jesus would come and do for us now. And we're so grateful, Jesus, that you are the light of the world, that you are the bread of life to feed our souls, that you are the lamb who died in our place on that cross. May our faith be inspired as we search your scriptures and learn more week by week and dedicate ourselves to you day by day. We pray in Jesus' name.